what we are going to talk about here is um, totally speculative. So you were absolutely right to ask me how, what are going to be the steps towards network society. Please don't ask what are going to be the steps towards this, because one, I don't know. And even if I did, it would take a long time. There would be a lot of steps. Um, now, also, this is going to be controversial for, for, for some of you. And caveat, I am somewhat uh, open-minded about my own conclusions. And I, and I, I am still um, straining against the, the boundaries that I think uh, we ought to accept. And this out from a philosophical point of view is always always dangerous uh, because it, it represents a, a moral vector, an agent uh, vector. Um, but still, I, I want to, to see how this is going to go. And originally, I thought I would start with definitions first and then application second. But the slides are now in a different order. So I will just talk about concepts and then apply them and then try to put the uh, entire thing together. We'll see how it goes. So um, we live in a very, very interesting universe uh, for, for many reasons. And we definitely uh, are starting to realize that any time we think we understand what's going on, we, we, we don't. It's just an illusion. There are many things uh, to discover. And there is actually mathematical proof of this. Uh, uh, Gödel, in the 30s, uh, actually sooner than that, whenever it was, um, it was um, Hilbert organized a conference at the beginning of the 20th century and listed 10 problems. And he said, OK, once these 10 problems are solved, mathematics is solved. And we can all go home. And, uh, and one of the problems led one of the participants in the, in, in the conference, Kurt Gödel, uh, to, 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 to think and come up with his incompleteness theorem, which not only uh, solved one of the 10 problems in Hilbert's list, but actually made his whole proposition uh, impossible and ridiculous. Gödel's incompleteness theorem basically says that any mathematical construct uh, allows strange enemies inside that cannot be answered within those constructs, statements that are undecidable. And then you, as a mathematician, are actually free to choose either, yes, I assume that to be true, or equally, you are in your own right to say, I assume that to be false. And one of the two becomes the axiom of an extended theory that is the building block of your next expansion. And it is amazing how it has always been true through hundreds and thousands of years, whatever crazy idea mathematicians would come up with, with normal methods or more modern methods of extending their theories about the, uh, about the mathematical, about mathematical objects, those theories and those objects would find sooner or later some equivalent in the universe. And, and we don't quite understand how that is. One philosophical argument about it is called the anthropic principle, which, to make it very simple, says if this universe was not conducive to human life, and human life requires action, requires explanation requires understanding of phenomena uh, because if there were chaos, there wouldn't be evolution, there wouldn't be directed change of structure, is necessarily like 
the one we are living in. The fact that it is explainable, the fact that it can be understood, there couldn't be any way otherwise. So it is a selection mechanism amongst all of the possible universes. Uh, some of them are, are crazy, uh, and, and we would just not exist in them. And we don't. We exist in a universe that, without needing a reason, can be explained. And for the past 13 billion years, the universe has been doing its thing, and we are now here, and we are our brains, we are able to look around and try to explain the universe, and at the same time, we recognize our brains as one of the most complex objects in, in the known universe. There is a hierarchy of complexity that we can actually see. And when Ray Kurzweil talks about exponentials and draws those curves, uh, whether they apply to chip transistor density or uh, data communication speeds, or any other of the really large number of parameters that he's tracking, he is also saying, and very few people realize that, that it is not a tendency that was just born uh, 100 years ago or 500 years ago or even 10,000 years ago with technological civilization. It is a tendency that you can recognize and plot backwards forever. The rate of uh, complexity has been aggregating in the universe exponentially since the Big Bang. Um, it is also the case that if someone was very smart, let's assume that the hypothetical future intelligent being uh, is, is such, after being born and just glancing around would be able to derive very rapidly, I don't know, let's say in a handful of seconds or microseconds makes no difference, almost everything we know about the universe. In particular, one thing is remarkable. It wouldn't be possible to live in the universe as a human being after uh, a billion years of the Big Bang because the heavy elements that constitute us would not have been synthesized at the time yet. Only after a certain generation of stars had been born and, and, and died and uh, re-aggregated to form new stars again, and then planets around those stars that contain the atoms that constitute our bodies, if you wake up as a human, you say, oh, carbon, all right, we are about 10 billion years after this universe was born. And there are a lot of things that you can deduce just with the power of your complex, rather remarkable brain. The brain has also, just as the universe, certain characteristics. The brain has uh, structures, has uh, uh, subunits, and we are trying to understand the brain better and better. Actually, a friend of mine, um, is, is, is trying to understand it better enough in order to be able and back it up and then potentially instantiate it uh, in other uh, substrates. Are you talking about like replicating brains in other organisms? So uh, his name is uh, Randall Conan. His website is, is called carboncopies.org and the movement is called substrate independent minds. The assumption is that, yes, we have seen and we are seeing the first example of what happens when matter starts to think, and that is a phenomenon expressed by our brains. But just as we recognize the unity of phenomena like waves, and it doesn't matter whether it is the ocean wave, a light wave, or an acoustic wave, and there are many other kinds, uh, patterns and sounds and harmonies and, and beauty can be expressed regardless of the medium. So the, the hypothesis here is that it is indeed possible to replicate um, everything we do 
in things that are uh, different from what, what brains are. There are other things that are characteristics uh, of, of brains on, on beyond uh, thinking. Uh, we have, for example, a brain waves that we don't fully understand yet, but we do think that they help make our brain cohere. They help maintaining a unity. They, may, they, they help making sure that a given part of the brain doesn't go in a way and another part of the brain doesn't go another way. Another um, characteristic feature of our brain is its size. We always uh, depict future beings uh, with huge heads and future mothers evidently need huge pelvises. Today, the birth canal is the limiting factor in the size of the human brain, as well as neurogenesis, the possibility of growing your brain after you are born, or our endurance as parents to hold on our kids 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, we don't know what is the outer limit of uh, parental uh, uh, maintaining of, of, of those uh, care relationships. And we have a name for what happens, and you know, we don't know uh, the, 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 the causes, whether they are genetic, environmental, all of them together, behavioral, they are, these are extremely complex um, uh, patterns of maladaptive behavior, uh, but we attribute it also to a malfunctioning brain that is not coherent. It allows identity to fragment. Um, we give them various names, uh, paranoia, uh, multiple personality disorder, whatever it is. Uh, the, the, person is enabled to maintain uh, a coherent agency um, that society and, and other people recognize. Now, we love computers and we are using the computer metaphor to explain a lot what we think we understand about the brain. Just as other uh, eras, other people used other metaphors. The clock was a metaphor for the mo motion of the planets. Uh, we love computers so much that we are trying to apply the way they work to many, many things. And as we understand the way we build computers and, and the, their functioning, we are projecting them to, to extremes. What would happen? if we could increase uh, computational power, well, we can build computers uh, that are made of smaller and smaller transistors. And uh, then we realize, okay, there is uh, uh, resistance, and at certain sizes, resistance stops working the way it used to work, uh, quantum phenomena take over, and your semiconductors don't uh, guide electrons anymore, they jump all around, and what used to be an acceptable level of uh, noise within your circuits becomes completely unmanageable. And here come, according to some, uh, Jordi Rose already built a quantum computer, including him, very proud of it. Google published papers that say they were unable to beat the quantum computer however they tried with their uh, classical uh, uh, attacks or classical approaches and, and, and at Singularity University on the NASA campus we have a DV quantum computer and one of our alumni has been um, hired by NASA to, to, to work on it and quantum computers are exactly the answer to this problem what happens when we shrink circuits so small that we are unable to pretend that quantum phenomena don't exist, they actually take over. Well, rather than treating that as a problem, we treat it as an opportunity, and we build an entire new architecture around it. 
Um, it is, by the way, um, astounding that uh, so much, and that is what I started with, around us is thanks to mathematics. Uh, Bitcoin, that is, that I mentioned previously, uh, is a fundamental mathematical invention, the blockchain. Um, and software is evolving is even faster than, than hardware, thanks to mathematics. Sorting algorithms have evolved in the past 30 years so much that Jordi, the founder of V-Wave, uh, says he'd rather apply a sorting algorithm from today to an Apple II from 1979 than not use uh, the sorting algorithm from those years on the supercomputers of today, it would be more effective. And it's, and it's really, really amazing. And actually, software is now a gating factor in the adoption and the diffusion of a lot of, uh, a, a lot of things, including quantum computers themselves. Rearranging our algorithms for quantum computers is a huge task. So, as we progress with these practical things, people theoretically run ahead and they say, okay, forget about trying to actually do it. If we assume that we are capable of just going all the way, where do we get up? Doesn't matter. Wherever we end up, end up at a given number of computations per second, per definition, that is our definition. Computronium is the state of matter that maximizes computation. It, it, it just cannot get better. We don't know how, we don't know when. That is its name. What it means is that if you want to compute more, the only way you can compute more is adding additional computronium. If you have a, a, a gallon of computronium, and you want to compute twice as much, you need two gallons of computronium. There's no other way. That is the definition. So what do you do with computronium? Well, certainly fabulous things, whatever they are. But uh, probably more interesting question is, given our premise that substrate independent minds are possible, is what does computronium want to do with itself? What does computronium want? And once again, this is a theoretical object. The answer to that question is, oh, the thing that wants th something that is made of computronium is called a Jupiter brain. Why? Because it's a fancy name. And because when you think about it, wow, a Jupiter-sized computronium object must be, just imagine the things it can do. It's called the Lattice. <laughs> and uh, there are other names as well, it doesn't matter. Uh, what is important is that, per definition, Jupiter brains want something, and what Jupiter brains want, Jupiter brains get, and the only way they can get what they want is by turning something that is not computronium into computronium. They are hungry, and they eat planets. However, we can try and model what Jupiter brains are like. Um, it, it used to be when Einstein formulated the general theory of relativity, which was um, Unexpected. The special theory of relativity was in the cards. It needed a physical interpretation, um, slowing down of time, the deformation uh, or the shortening of distances, etc., etc. Um, the uh, increase of mass, each of these as you approximate uh, the speed of light, and all of this has been experimentally observed. But already, 
decades before Maxwell's equations, the so-called Lorentz transformations, basically, it's there. They were mathematical things, and, and people didn't know what to do with them. And Einstein came uh, and, and gave them physical meaning. But he was very, very good. And rather than stopping there, uh, he did other things as well. Uh, he was 23 at the time. Uh, and uh, in a year's time, he uh, published a series of papers, another one that won him the Nobel Prize uh, about the uh, quantum electric effect, uh, and, and then formulated a general uh, theory of relativity, which is mathematically much more complex. It is much more difficult to derive a physical object out of it, and one of the physical objects that was derived from it pretty soon is a black hole. And then for several years, people were, we didn't know what to do with black holes really. And still, people don't really know what to do with black holes, um, including some people wanting to stop the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva because they are afraid that black hole uh, evaporation rates could be miscalculated. Miniature web, uh, black holes uh, are believed to, uh, through quantum effects, evaporate very rapidly. So physicists are saying, ah, no the problem. But others are saying, hey, listen, you are not sure. Let's not go there because a black hole could eat the, the, the planet. Um, and, and, and very soon, people started to think, OK, how are black holes when, for example, they rotate? How is gravity distributed externally, internally? What happens with them? is the so-called event horizon, which is invisible, very dangerous, because when you cross it, that's a one-way street. You cannot get out, if not in the form of a black hole radiation, which would do you no good. Uh, and people model what is the internal structure of these really weird objects. So we can try to do the same with Jupiter brains made out of computronium. And we can try to understand, OK, how are they like? What do they do? How do they think? And it is conceivable that just as human brains today have characteristic waves that help them uh, cohere, characteristic waves help computronium Jupiter-based Jupiter brains to here as well. And there is, as a consequence, a size limit to Jupiter brains. Think about it. Well, it's not about the birth canal, but it's about the maximum speed of propagation of signals. What is this maximum speed of propagation of signals? as we understand it in our physical universe, is the speed of light. <coughs> uh, in order to transfer useful information from one part of the physical universe to another part of the same physical universe, you are not supposed to be able to exceed the speed of light. So think about the Jupiter brain that wants to do things, and the only way according to our definitions, that it can want to do more things is by increasing in size. So I haven't calculated it, but there is a maximum size for the Jupiter brain to want one thing. And then it's another piece of celery. And lo and behold, the two sides of the Jupiter brain stop wanting the same thing. One size wants one thing, and the other side wants another thing. And then the only thing it can do is to split. Because the side that wants one thing will eat another piece of celery, and, and, and the other side will eat a planet. And, and the celery is on the left, the planet is on the, so on, on the right, and, and they, it just, it will, they will tear apart. And we will have two Jupiter brains. Very happy, because each of them can do their thing, and they don't need to argue. 
and they don't need to synchronize. And through this hardware, they can keep doing whatever they do. If you eliminate the speed of light constraint, then there is no size limit anymore on Jupiter brains. Jupiter brains can grow any size, and they can eat everything. By the way, just a, a, a little remark, Jupiter brains are three-dimensional fractals so that their critical density at no arbitrarily large or small radius exceeds that that would end up forming the black hole. Okay, so their density is uh, expressed uh, in, in a fractal uh, number and uh, uh, that uh, eliminates the issue of, okay, Jupiter brains close themselves off from the universe because they unavoidably turn, turn, turn themselves into black holes. Or rather, stupid Jupiter brains do that and smart ones don't. So the smart Jupiter brains in a universe that has no limit in the speed of light eat everything. What it is like to live in a universe where a Jupiter brain ate everything? Nick Bostrom, who's a philosopher, uh, formulated what is mistakenly uh, believed to say that we are in a simulation. The simulation argument doesn't say that. The simulation argument formulated by Nick Bostrom says that there are three statements, and one of these three must be true. One of these statements is that uh, humanity is going to be soon extinct. The second is that humanity will not conduct large-scale stimulations, even if it keep existing. And the third is that we are living in a simulation. Um, so let's look at these three one by one. The possibility that humanity goes extinct can be attributed to internal causes or external causes. Both of them depend on how smart we are and how fast we can become smarter in order to meet and solve challenges that come at us uh, at either a recognizable speed, for example, our ecological depletion of the planet, or unexpectedly, like when on the news you see an asteroid having passed Earth being announced, which is due to the fact that not even NASA sees them, because they typically, when they are fast, accelerated by the solar gravity, come towards us from the sun, and we are blinded. That is why it is so important and so mortally negligent that we don't put uh, uh, space telescopes in orbits where they are, where the Earth is not with respect to the Sun, because we need to map these coming. Otherwise, it will be always too late. Too late good or too late bad. As far as um, not doing large-scale simulations in an arbitrarily distant future, even if we end up surviving forever, well, we already love uh, simulated worlds. Uh, whether they are novels that we read, whether they are movies we go at, whether we uh, go and play video games, whether it is uh, virtual reality with goggles, uh, it is going to get better and better and better. And the likelihood that we stop wanting to do them is minimal. Uh, I, I don't see why we would ever stop. So as we get better and better and better, we will do more and more and more. The third argument is 
what I am concerned about. And it is that we are in a universe where faster than light travel is possible. The Jupiter brains made possible by this at arbitrary size ate everything. 13 billion years was enough. And we are inside the Jupiter brain being simulated by it. A lot of fun for it and for us. So the question is, can this be, um, is this a scientific question? One. And what is the moral vector of the question? So science itself evolves. We get better and better in understanding what science is and how we do it. Uh, and it's called epistemology. It's the science of science. And, and a lot of things that at first hand wouldn't look very scientific turn out to be the case. Cosmology, for example, is, is crazy. How can you do an experiment in a universe? You have one. You cannot play around with it. You cannot you know, put it in a jar. But we are smart enough to formulate theories that can be falsified through observations, which is the very definition of science, even if these observations uh, are giving us information about large-scale structures of the universe. As far as the moral vector of the question is concerned, I am of two minds, like a too large Jupiter bane living in a universe that has the maximum speed of light. Because on one hand, I have uh, an atavistic, chauvinistic attachment uh, to a potentially false belief that real is better. On the other hand, when my friend Randall is going to get what he's about to do right, I will be thrilled because I want to go to space and my meat body is totally bad at that. And the support structures to allow me to go to space will never allow me to do the things I would love to do. The way I know I want to go to space is being reinstantiated in nanoscopic probes that are accelerated by laser beams at a speed approximating that of light by the billions, and then communicating with each other at a necessarily diffused consciousness that can synchronize itself in a manner that is very different than the few liters of, of brain I possess now, and dying by the billions just by hitting against planets and whatever else. And then, I want to be able to claim that that kind of existence is not inferior uh, the, to the one that I am having now, even if a lot of people would say, oh, you are just a, a figment of imagination. It's not true that the David exists right there. Fermi uh, was an Italian physicist. Um, together with von Neumann, who was a Hungarian physicist, with Leo Szilard, who was an another Hungarian physicist, with uh, Edward Teller, who was another Hungarian physicist, so much so that there was Oppenheimer and Fermi that, that, that said, okay, all our, all our security problems, because this was the Manhattan Project for the atomic bomb, all our security problems would be solved if only we would get out of the room and the Hungarians could do it all, all by themselves. Um, well, Fermi and the others were out in the New Mexico desert. And they looked up at the sky and they said, and I quote, where the fuck is everybody? Close quote. And it is now formulated differently and it's called <laughs> the Fermi paradox. And, and by the way, at the time, UFOs did not exist. You know, 
it's in, in, in the newspapers, you did not read every day, oh my god, a new UFO. But the following is true. If, even if faster than light travel is not possible, as soon as we learn how to do slow ships, which are starships uh, that are generation after generation colonies that take 10,000 years to reach the next star, and then they take 10,000 years to build the next ship to reach the other star, in a million years, we will conquer the entire uh, Milky Way galaxy. And some of you might know that DARPA uh, instituted a new program uh, called the 100-year starship, which is not about building this thing, because we don't know how from an engineering point of view. And even a Pune ship that uh, would bring, I don't know, a dozen people to the next star would require a yearly energy budget that exceeds uh, that of that produced by the entire planet-wide civilization. But this project is designed to build the organization that is capable of thinking beyond a single administration for four years and then dismantling whatever the previous one decided, but can go ahead, plan, implement, launch, and manage a, a, a starship mission that lasts for centuries. Just as our predecessors were capable of doing with the cathedrals, where Things were built generation after generation, but they had God looking over them and keeping them, you know, uh, doing it. And this godless society cannot force itself to be as relentless in pursuing their dreams. Um, so, what we would do in this galaxy in a mere million years. And if somebody had a telescope in Andromeda and turned it around and looked at, at the Milky Way, Andromeda is the closest galaxy to us, two million light years away, they turned it around, looked at us, and they would go like, oh my God, what happened? The Milky Way just blossomed. Something is going on there, we don't know what. It's amazing. The things we would do to the galaxy, good and bad, doesn't matter, are nowhere to be seen in the universe. So it's not only that um, um, weekly news report with a bad boy or whatever it is, uh, is, you know, there are no second, secondary sources. It's not only that we, we, we haven't provably seen aliens according to scientific <clears throat> methods, but we have more and more questions about why we don't see people. Uh, 200 light years radius contains about 5,000 stars, and the electromagnetic emission of Earth today is such that we would be able to observe that emission around any of those stars, and we are not seeing them. And this radius increases every year with the sensitivity of our sensors. And there is a building sense of panic. I've been churning SETI at home numbers for, I think, 20 years. I, I, I haven't looked, but for 20 years, I was there waiting for the wow signal uh, to be discovered, either by me or by my fellow fanatics, uh, throwing more and more computation against the problem in nothing. Total silence. So, our universe evolves and it produces more and more levels of complexity. And it could be that it is our responsibility through the choices that we make in our mathematical constructions that create paths of exploration that don't necessarily branch over to a parallel decision tree that we have not taken 
to create a universe that has never been seen before. And that unique universe gives us a responsibility that goes far beyond what even the most fanatical ecologist has believed humanity has. And that cosmology that gives this uh, responsibility to the choices that you and you and you and all of us make day after day is a moral vector that uh, I believe is quite astounding. Thank you. Uh, yes, Alex? Okay. Um, so, um, you had a question. Yeah, the question about the deeper brain. So, uh, my question is this <coughs> if you have a deeper brain universe, which does not fit that's my travel, and it breaks off, what's the most rational thing for the deeper brain to do? But we just just beat the part that will possibly be focused and the cycle of beating itself. Yes, there will be wars among Jupiter brains. <laughs> And since wars evolve into society, <coughs> Jupiter brains will collaborate. Jupiter brains will have peace treaties. Jupiter brains will have uh, uh, reservations where matter is set aside and not eaten. And one of the answers to the Fermi paradox is that we could live in such a reservation. Um, you had a remark. Oh yeah, it was a, it was a couple. One was uh, if you're not familiar with the Galactus, you should check it out. So there's a there's a comic book series from around the eighties called The Silver Surfer, and there's an entity known as Galactus, which essentially was this this machine the size of a planet that escaped the big crunch from the last universe by entering ours, and it has these minions that it sets out, and all it does is eat the biomass of entire planets to sustain its intelligence. Wonderful. I will check it out. <laughs> so, it's, it's known as, so in the, in the Marvel universe, they have comics where they decide where they decide to fight the Galactus, yeah. and it's the entirety of every superhero in existence, and they don't even hurt the guy. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a Thank little you. observation. And the other thing was as it relates to DARPA, uh, the DARPA 100 challenge. Um, <clears throat> there's a video game Eve Online. It's one of the largest flying mm -hmm. uh, space simulator in RPGs. The premise for the game was that the Milky Way galaxy was propagated out by all governments and the bureaucracy was stagnating the entire universe, or galaxy mm -hmm. rather. So when they discovered the, the Eve wormhole, that was the universe that the entire video game was sent into find such a frontier okay. because people like the DARPA 100 were uh, planning how to bureaucratize the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and the other observation was uh, there's a TV series that just ended that the Green Lantern uh, came out with the last four episodes were about the Jupiter intelligence that um, they go to a parallel universe by accident, and there's this there's this there's this uh, intelligence that ate every single planet in the universe except for one, and then accidentally crossed over our ancient. Really, so I'll send you a link to follow through. Thank you. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it wasn't I. Well, I didn't care. Yeah. Uh, let's hear. Let's hear a few more questions. So there's, there's an interesting application. End state of uh, computer black holes, that that is in fact a uh, potential end state for any intelligent civilization that makes it that far. And that's where all the uh, that's where all the aliens are. They in fact, as you said, dropped out of office in space time um, by becoming willfully black holes and communicating with each other some form of advanced entangled communications. So space and, and so space time is not a uh, consideration for them. It's not a limitation. So that's another way of looking at it. Yes, so, so his remark was that uh, one of the theories is that uh, the end state of all successful alien civilizations is to form uh, Jupiter brains that uh, decide to become black holes because they are actually capable of uh, instantiating uh, uh, entangled communications uh, between various black holes. Well, I'm, uh, that's the most use of energy because uh, the smaller the size is, the less it takes to send. Um, 
there, there is a there is a very very interesting thing about uh, uh, black holes and and how black holes relate to universal Darwinism. Uh, Lee Smolin, who is a, 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 a contemporary physicist, uh, one day sat down and said, pen and paper in hand, maybe pencil. Uh, can I construct the universe by just changing its parameters? That creates more black holes than not what we think the current universe is capable of creating wherever they are. And however he played around with the various parameters that he could, there's no way that he could do that. And the observation that he derived, he derived from that exercise is that it is possible that black holes give rise to other universes that are born in them without touching the mother universe's space-time, that through this birth, uh, there is variation in the parameters of natural laws, and our universe itself is an nth generation child of this evolutionary sequence, where, to go back to the anthropic principle, the probability of sitting in a universe that is capable of generating only one or a few more black holes is statistically minimal as opposed to the probability of sitting in those fertile branches that give rise to many, many more child universes, one of which is ours. So, uh, to your argument, there is some theoretical foundation uh, and it is, it is fun stuff, <laughs> at least to me. Um, one last question. Three, two, one, thank you. Are you Hungarian? <laughs> yeah, I am Hungarian, by the way. Okay. Uh, I had fun. <laughs>